Um, right, well, we've had some very interesting views of past, present, and future. Um, but somebody asked me um, a question during the break which flummoxed me for approximately three seconds, which is why, as a linguist, should I be interested in banking scandals? And what we've heard quite clearly, this has got nothing to do with mathematics, absolutely nothing to do with finance, and everything to do with language. Now, if you remember dear old Dr. Bronowski, who on the Braves Trust would always say, it all depends on what you mean by. So here we've got profits turned into loss and debts turned into assets, um, all sorts of wonderful things done at the stroke of a dictionary. Um, now, we've got time to go into these points in um, a lot more detail, but um, not so much words, but odd phrases I've been jotting down. And um, perhaps as a way of going forward, I was just going to mention to our um, speakers a number of phrases which came up. Victimless crime. Now, rather interesting that Brandon was getting into um, possible catastrophes and disasters, but is there a feeling that every time you hear that some hapless trader in the city has lost $3.2 billion and his only defence was the day before he'd made 4.7, so he thought he was going to be okay. I think that was uh, uh, one which came up fairly recently. Um, is it so removed from everybody that somehow we don't think this is real? And are the people involved in these um, mega numbers actually living in a world where those numbers have no sense either. Forensic accounting, the number of university courses which hope to recruit lots of students by adding the word forensic. Um, it seems so curious, you have these highly qualified, terribly experienced people um, who are meant to be looking over everybody's shoulder. Um, I always think of the blood-curdling letters that banks send to my students when they're 50 pounds overdrawn. And you think these unfortunate 19-year-olds being pursued for 50 quid. And then you have these people walking around whose debts have at least nine noughts on the end and growing by the day. Um, the other word is loophole. We heard that four years of legislation can be brought tumbling down within approximately 30 minutes of concentrated thought by the right people. So there are... Um, we take perhaps scandal as one word on this particular ladder of terms, but I do wonder if we can go into the other side, um, the gamekeepers rather than the poachers. Now, this is really the audience's chance to participate. We plan to take um, questions in sort of bunches of three to give our speakers an opportunity to reflect. But before I take questions, so if you'd like to think of questions three at a time. Lauren has just materialised um, with the microphone. Um, it's very simple. You have to catch my eye and you have to have the microphone, not only for all the folk we have downstairs in the overspill area, but of course our many viewers online worldwide who won't actually hear the question unless you have a microphone. Gentlemen, one thing I'd like to start off is whether you would care to comment on the other presentations which you've um, heard this afternoon. Um, Edward, was there anything which you'd like to pick up on from what you've heard from Michael Brandon? Um, what can I say? Well, um, Mike's points, I thought, um, were, were interesting and rather followed on in, in as I expected, in rather greater detail of the, gen of the general sketch um, I was drawing on. One of the things I asked Mike in our scandalously coffee-free or tea-free tea break. Uh, uh, look at the small print. <laughs> the word tea did not appear. Um, <laughs> just a picture that whetted our appetite. I need to be disappointed. One of the things I asked Mike, um, which I, he gave me an evasive answer, but in front of all of you he can't be so evasive, was what um, it's all right to be wise after the fact with the Enrons and the Worldcoms and so on and so forth of this world, but what indicators, or, or for instance more recently in Japan, the Olympus scandal, mm. what, what sketches, what indicators could one be looking for to identify some of these accounting scandals in advance? So at the risk of repeating my question and demanding a, <laughs> a fuller answer, Mike, that would be the question I, I'd ask you. Um, with Brandon's point, I, I, my feeling about the government debt, potential 
debt scandal, so, so to speak, is it, it's a scandal of potential losses, if you, if you will, but I don't quite see the nature of a typical financial scandal or fraud in the fact that the government is both issuing its own liabilities and through the Bank of England controlling the, the value in the long term of the money, because it may be that one of the ways in which our economy can delever is actually through a, a rise in inflation and and the, um, and the bondholders are just going to have to take it on the chin. I, I'm not sure if and it's happened after the Second World War, and uh, it was frankly more preferable to the, than the deflation that occurred in the 1920s, which the British uh, didn't care for at all. Mm. Mike, what about your comments? Okay. Um, the first thing um, I would say, um, I think that it's fairly obvious from what Edward said and sort of ties into what I found, is that what changes is very little. The same human sort of uh, motivations that cause scandals for the South Sea bubble cause problems today and presumably will cause problems in the future. Um, I would say on um, the logic of Brandon's case, I would have to sit down and think about it very deeply uh, and follow the causal links, because I'm not sure I got them all. Um, I uh, said to Brandon uh, when we were sort of um, talking uh, last night, because we, we had dinner last night, um, is that uh, I'm quite surprised that so far inflation has not been used as a way by the government to get us out of the crisis that we're in, since it seems to me that um, it's easy for uh, governments to get rid of debt by creating inflation, and then it just erodes the debt. Uh, so I'm quite surprised that they, they haven't done that. On the, supplement, the, sort of the supplemental question that um, Edward asked me about what indicators, yes, well, we can all be wise after the event, but that's the whole problem. It's working out, you have to sort of remember and um, if we take uh, Brandon's area, HSBC's report, and the report now is running to 400 pages, I gather. Uh, very, very few people uh, would be able to understand uh, those reports. David Tweedy, uh, who was, as some of you may know, a very canny Scotsman, who headed the um, International Accounting Standards Board, said that he didn't understand some of these standards uh, on derivatives because they were so complex. You can only, I think, um, look for very simple things. And if I was to say one thing that you could look for is, uh, but you'd have to read the accounts very carefully, and you know, and most people drop off to sleep before they got to past page three is to look for changes. What has changed? If the company has changed its year-end, why has it done that? If the company changed its accounting policies, why has it done that? If it's changed its, uh, some of its fixed assets to current assets, why has why it done that? But essentially, if it was easy to spot these frauds, then the auditors would have done it and uh, the it would have been picked up long before. So it's not easy. Uh, if, I, if anybody in this room could spot frauds, then they'd be a millionaire, I should think, because they could sell their, uh, their advice pretty quickly. Brandon. Um, first of all, I, I, I suppose let me, t let me get one off my chest, which, it, which is uh, uh, on accounting, because um, uh, you know, I think Mike makes a very makes some very good points, but but um, uh, I have lived through a number of accounting regimes for various banks, and we change them all the time. And basically, I think that they get more and more misleading all the time. I think that the attempts to reform accounting towards uh, mark to market forms of accounting, fair value, has been a complete disaster. Um, it's founded on a false concept that markets are efficient, that uh, a rational expectations works. Uh, it doesn't. 
Uh, and the end result is complete confusion in the way in which accounts. And, and frankly, as uh, I had the uh, I had the um, uh, board committee on uh, audit, audit committee of Gatehouse, and frankly, we can write that profit to any number we want, um, because the accounting rules are so ridiculous as to allow me to account for one set of bonds that we've got. I can account for them on an accruals basis. I can account for them on a uh, mark to market through p &L. I can account for them as a uh, mark to market, but only through capital account and not necessarily to take it through p &L. And I can account for them on a, what was the other basis? Oh, and I can account for them on a, on a purely held to maturity basis. So it means I don't have to take uh, anything other than if there's a very specific reason why I should take a provision. And I can do all four of those to that portfolio at the same time. Okay? So I can write some of the portfolio over here, some over there, some over there, and if I want to move the profits around, I'll just move some of the portfolio from one to the other. It's as easy as anything. I mean, it's just utterly ridiculous. They say, well, you can't just move it. And I say, no, I sold it and then I bought it back within two seconds of one another. Well, one second. Well, actually, I just move the numbers across. Um, the, the whole accounting profession, to my mind, is bankrupt of ideas and bankrupt of any meaning in terms of any analysis you might wish to do. So uh, I, um, uh, you know, I will get that one off my chest. I think it's a profession that has died. Um, in uh, and now they're trying to get uh, board members' boards. Uh, I mean, one of the most interesting ones is there's a provision under the Companies Act that requires the, uh, our, your auditors to sign off on the true and fair, that the accounts represent true and fair view of the company. No audit firm will do that. Uh, they've ceased doing it about five years ago. They sign off on, this is a true and fair view of the company in accordance with our international financial reporting standards. That's what the sign off says. They will not move from that. There have been moves to get the board, and I've been in negotiated discussions with Deloitte on this quite a bit and KPMG, to get the board, and particularly myself as the head of uh, audit, to sign off on the accounts as being a true and fair view under the Companies Act. And my reaction to that was, I will not sign the accounts as representing a true and fair view of the company, all the while those accounts are prepared under international financial reporting standards. Because I just think international financial reporting standards do not show a true and fair view of the company. And so I will insist on having another method of accounting, which I uh, uh, bought in, which will look more formal like the sort of valuation methodologies. It'll be probabilistic. I mean, if you're trying to tell the value of something which you hold in the future, it can't be a deterministic number. We don't know the future, it's unknowable. So it must be a, it must be a probabilistic number. It must be somewhere between here and there, depending on a whole load of things that can drive it. So you can't have forward looking accounts which represent deterministic numbers. The whole idea is, is a logical nonsense. And the failure of the accounting profession to understand that simple rule seems to me to be catastrophic. Um, uh, so that's where, that's where I... You know, there will endlessly be accounting scandals because the accounting rules just don't make any sense. Um, uh, might, might want to come back on some of that. Um, uh, Edward, I think, it, it's, uh, I, think this, I think it is a list of the trees. And one of the things you shouldn't take from my talk is that I believe that every scandal necessarily has social consequences. In fact, I believe the vast majority of them don't. Um, but I do believe that there are scandals, uh, financial scandals, which have led to disastrous social consequences and, frankly, the murder of people, uh, be that by governments or, or, or otherwise. And, um, and uh, these um, are the most extreme, I would add. I've lived through two of them in the UK, um, and it does relate directly to this idea that uh, inflation is a benign idea. Uh, it's not. Uh, it damages people's lives. It damaged the lives of my parents. My parents uh, decided uh, after the war, I was born in 1948, but my parents decided that uh, rather than um, buy a house that they were looking to buy, um, they, would, uh, they would invest in war loan. Uh, of course, it destroyed their finances for 10 years. I was nine years old before they could get back enough money to deposit into a house. I learned from that. That's one of the reasons why I became a banker. Because in all honesty, what I learned from that was that speculation is the thing that you need to do sometimes to, 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 be, to look after yourself in this world. Because the government isn't going to do it for you. 
So what I did was, in the 1970s, I bought two houses. I mortgaged myself to the hill. I didn't tell the bank how I'd done it. Um, I, I, made, I, I doubled my equity in, in, in my houses in a year um, because inflation was rocketing away and there was ice sitting on two of them. And they didn't know about the other one. And, um, and nobody did until uh, you know, I was safely out of there. Um, but I made a lot of money. And that was, I made that money out of speculation against the government who was pursuing a policy of devaluing the currency quite deliberately and trying to destroy my wealth. And I found a way of actually doing exactly the opposite, making money out of it. Because people will always win and lose. You don't win and lose on skill, and you don't win and lose on your value to society. You win and lose on whether you can outwit the government and its policies. And so, because they are designing to destroy your value and you need to, you need to gather value from it. So um, I learned not to trust governments. You may remember that this was a period, and particularly the deleveraging from it when uh, Maggie got in and uh, tried to restore the finances, was a period of huge social upheaval. With, I'm Welsh by background and my family, uh, my father was the um, managing director of a, of a coal company. I made coal cutting machines in Wrexham. And, um, uh, and what it did to the lives of, of many people. Um, and what it's still doing to the lives of generations after that uh, is dreadful. But don't blame Maggie for it. Blame the governments before. They created the inflation. She drove it out. But the inevitable consequence of that is the destruction of the lives of a lot of people. So that, I think that answers my point about uh, whether or not this is victimless crime. Um, Mike, I think as an accountant, you might like a, a right of reply. And I wonder if you'd like to pick up on my phrase forensic accounting. Um, are Excuse these me. things so difficult actually to locate? Sorry, how are, you? are these things so difficult to locate? Or are they difficult to locate because they're so well hidden? So I still didn't catch what the first bit. With forensic accounting, yeah. are they difficult to locate? Uh, these um, scams and general problems, is that because they're hard to find or because they're well hidden? Um, you mean all the techniques? Yes. Uh, it's, fun. Yeah. it's a combination of, uh, of I think, um, it comes back to asymmetric information um, in that what you have to go back, all, all situations are social situations in essence. If you are auditing a company, then basically the company has all the cards because they know the business. They're often the people who are actually doing the, the uh, donkey work are new graduates for the first couple of years. They do all the, the work. It's very easy for skilled managers to put, um, yeah, it's basically to pull the wool over their eyes. Having said that, there are notable failings and there are tests that should have been done that was not done. But a lot of it, I think, is basically that uh, the management uses its knowledge to, uh, just as, well, we had a classic example here, um, if, which Brandon said, you know, I've got, he's got four valuation bases to, to play with. Now, when the auditors come along, if he decides to do A, he's not going to say, oh, yeah, I thought I'd do A because I threw a coin and, you know, it came up with A, he's going to say, well, I thought that in the circumstances it was most appropriate. He would use a different argument for B, a different argument for C, and a different argument for D. And it would be very difficult for the auditors to unpick that. So um, I don't... And then the other thing um, is, if you're taking about the hidden perspective, um, apparently, well, in Enron's accounts, which I have seen, um, yes, you could tell that they had, if you remember that, um, you may remember that Enron was a company that had a lot of off-balance sheet finance. In other words, it had a lot of liabilities in companies that were not recorded on the balance sheet. Um, there, it was, some of that was explained on page, I can't remember, 80 of the accounts, note 40, said that there was this going on. But you had to be very, very clever, very, very knowledgeable to find it because it was hidden in the notes. That doesn't say that auditors shouldn't find it. But it just says that um, it is um, very difficult. So it is hidden. And while I'm suggesting, oh no, just pick up 
for those people in the audience who might not understand uh, the difference between... It used to be, in the UK, that the UK companies followed UK generally accepted accounting practices. And most accountants in the UK thought that those accounting practices were good practices. Since the 1st of January 2005, all listed companies in Europe, including in the UK, follow international accounting standards. And because that's part of the EU rules. Now, in a sense, that's nothing to do with ordinary accountants. Ordinary accountants in the UK, if they'd have had the vote, would not have voted for international standards. That was imposed by the European Union. Uh, for reasons of standardisation within Europe, more than, if you like, to try and give a true and fair view. And the reason that sort of um, uh, auditors will not sign off to true and fair view with the Companies Acts or whatever is that most of the big companies are following international accounting standards and whatever accounting standards you follow, you will get different results. And the other thing that hasn't been mentioned um, is that uh, until very recently, um, and most uh, accountants, again, in the UK, would subscribe to this, one of the fundamental purposes of accounting was stewardship. In other words, you sh should hold the directors to account. But the International Accounting Standards Board has gone down the route of decision-making, that the purpose of accounting is to allow users, generally shareholders, to make decisions, not stewardship. To make decisions, there is this idea that you should mark to market. In other words, you should use fair values, which Brandon uh, ascribed to. And again, um, it's not quite so bad for the UK, but in lots of countries in the world, there aren't advanced markets to get fair value. It's being driven by, basically, the American capitalist markets. So if you were to say that you know, accountant, accounting is uh, in difficulties, then I would say yes, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it was the accountants that have got us here. Um, it's basically decisions coming out of uh, the European Union have led us to uh, adopt um, accounting standards that may not be particularly appropriate uh, for the UK environment. Mm. Government doesn't seem to be coming very well out of this afternoon, does it? Mm. Edward, I saw your eyebrows waggling. Did you want to make another comment? Um, <coughs> not really. I, I mean, to go back, I don't want to bang on about it, but... Yeah, in, if there is an inflation, it's just a distribution of wealth, but within a society. Now there may be, you know, there may be uh, economic loss of efficiency in that distribution of wealth. At the moment, as far as I see it, part of our problem is we have too many financial claims on the future and not enough future income in which to pay off those financial claims. So, some way, way or other, um, that is going to have to be. Resolved. Now, clearly, if one were retiring and sitting on a lot of government bonds, you'd like it to be resolved in a non-inflationary way by future generations of taxpayers paying large amounts of tax to pay off the debt. Now, if you're you know, still in the workforce and paying taxes, you might actually appreciate um, some um, the alternative. As for the question whether the inflation is uh, why why inflation hasn't been used, I think it is being used. Uh, the, the other term. We heard about the Reinhardt and Rogoff paper. Carmen Reinhardt uh, wrote another paper about financial repression. And, and financial repression basically means um, keeping inflation or nominal GDP growth above the rate of government bond yields, uh, which is what's happening in the UK and happening in the US. And it's a fairly stable way of paying down a large debt burden. Yes, there will be losses, there will be costs. One thing about inflation is that if a society can't sit, sit down at the table and agree how to divide up the losses, uh, which we are quite patently incapable of doing, then inflation is the, is the way uh, 
to resolve the, uh, the answer. It's not, not necessarily a particularly pleasant way. Um, on, as to Mike's point, I was, I was thinking when you were talking about the shift to international accounting standards from the British standards of a general shift. I mean, I wonder whether this was reflected in fraud. Was a shift from a sort of rules, you know, towards a rules-based system as, as opposed to a principles-based accounting system and whether that uh, is marked by a shift to fraud. And the other thing I was thinking is that perhaps the source of economic value added, to use a sort of rather jargony phrase, in, from companies is becoming more complex. And as, I mean, in the old days, if you think of it, a railway, I hate to mention a mine, but a, let's think of it, a railway has a certain amount of capital stock. You can account for the capital stock and generate cash flow from passengers. And perhaps the source of value in companies today is more nebulous and therefore more difficult to account and therefore allows for, for more, um, for more uh, creative judgment. Does that ring a bell with you? Just a quick response and then we'll go to questions yeah, yeah. very quickly. Very quick response would be that ISB claims that it's principles driven rather than rules dri driven. Uh, the, the rules driven um, is the states. They're very rules driven and they don't adopt IASB. And yes, I think that there is a lot to say that as um, businesses get more uh, complex and, uh, if you like, away from material buying and selling, then yes, it becomes a lot more difficult to account for them. Right, now here you've had plenty of time now to think of some questions. We need three. Lauren, um, one here, one in the middle, and one here, just to get started. And then second round. Uh, thank you. My name's John Ewing, and my question to the panel is, are we effectively doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past? Or is there some hitherto elusive form of regulation that might possibly <coughs> smooth things out? Or maybe, would that be simply to defy human nature? Okay, the gentleman sort of next to you, Lauren, in the middle, yes. My name is Philip Dews. I've, lived, I've listened with great interest to the past scams, and I just pray that we'll find ways to stop these from happening. However, my question to the panel relates to future prospects. I watch the Kaiser Report on Russian television, and they are explaining right now how scams are being manufactured in Wall Street, and I assume that I'm not the only person who hears this, and I'd like to know whether the panel uh, are aware of the Kaiser Report, and if they've listened to some of these scams which are currently being manufactured for future delivery on Wall Street, and whether you think that something ought to be done about it. Ooh. Thank you. Good question. And Ian, third one. Uh, I'm uh, Ian Harris. Um, my question really is about intention um, and scandals, because uh, when all three of you were speaking for slightly different reasons, I was thinking in a rather legalistic way about scandals and frauds, that, that uh, for something to be a, a, a genuine fraud, uh, there needs to be actus reus and mens rea, to use the, the legal terms. There needs to be an, an act, and there also needs to be intention. And we were talking a lot about acts, but not quite so much about intention. And reading between the lines of what each of you said, um, in the talk about the history of, uh, of scandals, I think very many of the examples that you went through, Ed, the people who, per uh, who, who perpetrated the frauds didn't start out by perpetrating a fraud. They started out with an idea, perhaps with some hubris, perhaps with um, charisma, perhaps thinking they could achieve more than they could achieve and other people's money was bundled up in it, and in, and, and in very many of them, they then thought that they needed to look after those other people's mo money, uh, and, the, and, and the thing developed into a fraud. But at some point in most of the major scandals, they must have known that they were now perpetuating a, 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 a significant fraud. Maxwell, mm. by the end, for sure knew. Mm. Um, Bernie Madoff, by the end, for sure knew. And with some of them, and with, and, and, and with some of them, with some of them, perhaps at the beginning. And listening to what Michael was saying and his distinction between creative accounting 
um, and, uh, and, 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 and fraud. Uh, you know, I'll put my cards on the table. I'm a, a, an accountant. I don't practice as an accountant. But I, 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 I do practice what I would believe to be creative accounting, but I certainly would not practice what I would consider to be fraud. But, but, but what many people do um, is try to come up with you know, imaginative or useful ways of putting their financial information across. And maybe they're trying to be consistent, and then they find they can't be consistent anymore. And then what they end up doing is perpetuating a fraud. And, the, and, and, and that's a journey that many of these things go on. And Brandon, the, the, the main example that you were trying to give, which revolved around government, you started off by saying these people don't set out to defraud anybody. But with quite a lot, I would suggest, of the government-caused scandals, there must come a point where some people at the heart of government really know that this thing is a bubble and they are perpetuating something that is pretty close to a fraud. And I would just like, really, your, your view on intention and, and whether there's anything that, that, that we can do about it. Is this just human nature? Or can we put you know, some sort of a you know, checkpoint into, uh, uh, in, into things, some sort of capacitor that just goes off, blows a whistle, um, and, and stop some of these things from developing into, uh, in, into really, really dreadful scandals. Right, so we're doomed to repeat past mistakes. Have we read the Kaiser report? Do we know about ghastly goings on in Wall Street? And um, does criminal intention start off as being criminal? Uh, which I think um, echoes the point I had, was when does creative accounting actually become criminal? Gentlemen, who would like to start on those three? Um, Edward. Okay, well, I, I did try and address the issue of are we doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past in my talk and, and I said yes and people said that's human nature um, and why and I think it links to the question of, of intention and, and the scandals because um, if the as I'm suggesting that the cycle of fraud is linked to the speculative cycle when asset prices are rising uh, then there is the, the, potent, the shortcuts that are being made, whether in terms of over-leveraging or, or even some sort of some, some, some uh, poor accounting, let's say, um, are, are covered over. And when the bust occurs, then people frankly have a choice between whether to um, engage in a fraud to cover up the problem they're in or to fess up and, and, and be kicked out of the company, lose control and so on and so forth. And I dare say there are many potential frauds that never actually emanate into frauds because the person who's in charge of the company actually decides to go down the route of just acknowledging the loss and being kicked out and losing control of the company. So I think, it's, I, I think that that cycle uh, it is inevitable. I, I think what one does note that most of the frauds tend to occur, or the exposure of the frauds, of the big frauds, tend to occur after the bust. I, I, there is now talk of banks, of, of the of banking regulation being more, um, being more um, counter-cyclical, where, uh, where when, when the credit boom is going on, that banks should have, um, you know, should be required to have hi higher you know, uh, loan loss provisions and larger capital, you could uh, create a, a counter-cyclical uh, regulatory and an accounting environment by saying that when a bubble is taking place, fraud is more likely and therefore let's put more resources into, the, uh, re into investigation of the frauds. What happened in the US, as far as I can gather, is that the SEC, the, the SEC was starved of funds and investigators in the 1990s, uh, which contributed to the corporate scandals that came about with Enron and with WorldCom. And then subsequently, um, the, the, the Federal Reserve was the chief regulator uh, of, the, of well, there were a number, it's rather complicated, the American regulatory system for banks. But basically, the Federal Reserve is the chief regulator because Alan Greenspan didn't want to know that there was a bubble in housing and it was frankly a sackable offence for any Fed researcher to mention this B word in front of Greenspan. The, the, federal, the, the authorities did not exercise their responsibility to regulate the mortgage fraud that was quite obvious to anyone 
who was within 100 miles of the mortgage market uh, at the time. So it was a palpable failure of regulation. Now, um, one thing Mike says is that the, 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 the penalties for poor, um, for, for financial, uh, for accounting frauds and scandals are very low. Well, the penalties for regulators for getting it completely wrong uh, uh, seem to be promotion. Uh, uh, in this country and in America. And, and there is no way in which uh, regulators, as far as I see, uh, seem to be held to account for their extraordinary failures over the last two decades. And so I suppose you could, I mean, what, what, what FDR did, Roosevelt did with the New Deal, is he um, took a, a former bootlegger and stock manipulator, namely Joe Kennedy, father of JFK, and put him in charge of the SEC, um, you should really um, you know, take some um, foxes and turn them into gamekeepers and give them a charge of uh, regulating in a counter-cyclical way and, as I say, following the money. Wherever the money is flowing is the most likely source of the fraud and tighten up your regulation in those areas. Thank you. Uh, Mike? Yeah. Um, I think sort of on repeating the lessons of the past, I think that probably we are in many ways doomed to re repeat it. Uh, the only things that would change uh, it would be, and I wouldn't have an awful lot of faith in the first, is ethics. I know, for example, I've just been spending some of my spare time doing some marking for one of the certified uh, accountants exams, which is professional ethics. And they are, one of their reactions to the crisis was to induce, introduce this paper in the hope that the students would you know, learn about ethics on their course and be more ethical accountants. Uh, reading some of the scripts, I do rather doubt <laughs> that that will happen. The other uh, probably more promising uh, avenue would just be to make the penalties just so severe that people wouldn't dare to do it. Uh, the, the, um, I believe the only person I know who was executed uh, was the head of a Chinese company. Uh, who was found guilty and he was executed. I think it's um, one of the, Admiral Bing, they said that uh, the English always used to shoot admirals to encourage the others. But that, that might have some deterrent effect, but I can't see us doing that. Uh, on the Kaiser report, uh, no, I haven't read the Kaiser report, uh, but I think it's um, very, um, it's very unsurprising that merchant banks, for example, in the Enron, were there devising the schemes that Enron used. And it's quite a profitable business. It's just like um, if you've seen the uh, debate recently on Starbucks, and you know, you, they talked to basically um, Starbucks, who made a voluntary contribution. Uh, but basically, uh, Google have just said, well, we've done nothing wrong. And basically, the, if you've heard the tax accountants speaking, they said, well, the companies haven't broken the law. We've been advising them. That's our job, you know. And uh, I think that there is, yeah, there, it's very profitable for consultancy firms, for merchant bankers to uh, devise schemes. And after all, if they're not breaking the law, then what are they doing wrong? You can say that they are ethically not correct, but then they would argue the rules should be changed so that what they are doing is, unless is incorrect. I'm um, sorry, just to come in at that point, mm -hmm. Brandon, do you read the Kaiser report? Uh, or listen no. to it? No? Uh, no, I'm afraid I don't. Um, I would suggest that fraudsters don't always start out to be fraudsters. Mm. I knew Nick Leeson quite well. I don't think he started out to be a fraudster. He turned into one, uh, and a very effective one, but he, but he didn't start out that way. Um, and he didn't start out with the intention when he did some of the things he did of being a fraudster. Madoff did, um, which is very different. So we're talking about different kinds of individuals having different motivations. And I certainly think that um, you know, not all fraudsters start out to be fraudsters. And I don't believe governments start out to be um, destroyers of the value of their currencies. I think they just turn into them in the end. Um, or at least given a certain set of circumstances, rather like Leeson, they believe they're doing the right thing and then it starts to turn away, it starts to run away with them. So I think that, um, no, I don't think all, all fraudsters uh, are, 
uh, start out to, that way, I think. Um, uh, but it's very hard to admit once you're in the mire that you're in the mire. You always think you can get yourself out of it. Nick always thought he could get yeah. himself out of yeah. it. The next yeah. deal will get him out of it. And in many ways, it nearly did. Yeah. I mean, it, it was only the uh, Kobe earthquake that really did for him. Yeah. Uh, his positions would have been great if the, yeah. you know, he'd put it all right if the Kobe earthquake hadn't happened. So it divine is, intervention. Yeah. It, divine <laughs> intervention, which, yeah. um, which does bring me to Gatehouse Bank, because Gatehouse Bank is a Sharia bank. And so I have to work with a, uh, what amounts to a chief ethics officer. Um, I get told what is and isn't ethically acceptable. And, uh, you know, things like, Mel Brennan, I'm afraid you can't sell something you don't own. Um, and uh, which, which kind of kills the whole derivatives <laughs> business, pretty much. <laughs> um, but um, you know, it's an interesting it's an interesting set of challenges mm. to try and run a business which actually has a very strong ethical code, mm. which is enforced. So it's not kind of something you can you can't mm. dodge your way around it very easily. It's enforced, um, and um, that I think is uh, it, it has been for me very interesting because. Um, you kind of always feel, strangely enough, I mean, the history of many banks, including Barclays, is that they were founded by um, people of deep religious um, uh, belief. They were Quakers. And uh, when I first got to the executive committee, we still held a meeting every morning called Prayers, where all the main, the top managers of the bank uh, would get together in a room rather like this. And it used to be a prayer meeting. What it was was a business of the day meeting in those times, but it had originally been a prayer meeting that developed into a business of the day meeting. And it did give you quite, and we, we actually always kept the original uh, boardroom uh, to hold it in. Uh, so we actually, we rebuilt the boardroom in, you know, the, of the 1600s in, uh, in different, biz, different buildings. So we always had one room, which was, which was exactly panelled as that room had been, it was that room. And um, to remind us of our roots. So I think that, um, uh, what happens uh, and what has happened is uh, I think that, that, that uh, my honest belief is that kind of cheap money ran away with itself and we all found that we could make ourselves very, very rich very easily and, and nobody can really resist that. It's very hard to get people to resist the idea that, that somehow they, they don't deserve to be rich, you know, um, when they can see how easy it is. So I'm a deep and strong believer in penalties. Um, I did once say to, to John Varley when we were, he was signing off on the accounts and he said, should I sign off on these? And I said, well, I'll tell you what, if they prove to be false, because we were signing off on the US accounts, which are filed in, uh, with the Fed and they're filed, uh, sorry, with the SEC, and, uh, and uh, support our share quote in the US, um, do remember to murder your um, chief accountant because you'll get a much lower sentence for murder in the UK than you will for defrauding, <laughs> for signing off on a false set of accounts in the US. And, uh, and uh, he said, fine, you know, <laughs> I'll remember that one. And, um, and uh, I think that that is, uh, that is um, uh, something that I would say is changing, is that the penalties in the US in particular for uh, breaching uh, regulation are becoming very much more serious than they were, both in terms of prison sentences you might face, but also in terms of the fines. You know, we also say HSBC is a billion pounds. Yeah, yes, Edward, do you want to come in? Yeah, there's one point there. That Sarbanes-Oxley, I can't remember, 2002 mm. or 2003, which, which did tighten up the penalties for false accounting. The, one of the, the two concerns, first is that companies stopped listing in the US and started listing their rubbish in London, uh, which is good for London investment banks. And secondly, a whole load of companies were delisted and went into private equity and so on and so forth. So again, it fits to the general principle that every regulation is gamed in the end and, and doesn't really achieve its, its end. It just changes, as I say, the nature of scandal. Yeah, I, I would just add a couple of things on the, the motivation. Yeah, I, I would agree with Bra Brandon that m almost all the people who start off doing financial statement fraud, if I put it that way, don't actually see it in their own minds that they are defrauding the shareholders. It's very different from somebody helping themselves to a computer and walking out with it, in which case you know that you are or taking money from the till, because that is, you are stealing property. In this case, you're not necessarily stealing property. What you are doing is inflating profits, 
which would mean that your share options are worth more. So there's that indirect causation. And also, um, I would agree with Brandon, but a lot of people, uh, as I said, I think when I was talking, you know, uh, just believe that if only they can do a little bit more, they will get themselves out of the mess mm. that they got themselves into, mm. but that doesn't always uh, transpire. Yes. Um, I think we should take another round of three questions. This gentleman came out on the one behind, that gives us two, and we'll have the lady up the back if we may. Yes, one. And then, uh, well, yes, the gentleman there, then the one behind. Yes. In fact, my original question was asked far more eloquently by Ian Harris, so I'll think of another one. Um, I think Brandon made the comment that for the first time in living memory, UK productivity appears to have stalled. Uh, a, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on how it is measured, and, uh, and B, whether it's possible that, in fact, that perhaps creative accounting in the past has been overstating it, and that is why we, we have this phenom phenomenon occurring. Mm -hmm. Gentleman behind. Uh, John Mercer. Until now, we've associated creative accountancy with fraud. Now, I came across uh, an instance where creative accountancy was necessary in order to create a true and fair picture of what the company was doing. Uh, this is a company in a land far, far away, by the way. Um, the actual accounts showed that the company was making an enormous loss. The accounts which they sent to head office minimised the loss because the executives didn't want to lose their job. The accountant finally got round to doing the public accounts which had to be submitted to the government and these showed that the company had made an enormous profit. Now, the problem I think is that governments tax profits and therefore they have a vested interest in drawing up laws to maximise profits and to force companies and executives to make profits when in fact the company is probably operating at a loss. I find it very difficult to understand why any company which owes money can actually be making a profit. Right. Thank you. And the lady at the back, Lauren, just the third one, if you may. Uh, Rose Mishori. Um, Brandon, you mentioned a looming social disaster in 2020. Yeah. Would you like to elaborate so at least the people here can avoid it, if possible? <laughs> right, there's a challenge. Um, so uh, how do we measure UK productivity and have we actually inflated it? Um, the actual accounts versus the final set and the public face of the accounts and does the government want us to declare profits so it improves its taxes and um, can we make sure that we're out of the country by December 2019? Gentlemen, Brandon, you want to come in first? Let's start, let's start with the miserable answer first and we can feel cheered up as we go towards it. OK, well, as I said, I, I, let, let me elaborate first of all on, on what the disaster I think is going to be, which is that I think um, uh, the way in which government is forcing insurance companies and banks to hold more and more government debt is actually going to mean that uh, whatever uh, pension you have got is, is going to disappear pretty quickly. Um, uh, what I mean by that is if you bought government bonds, government bonds have an average duration of about 15 years and, um, uh, and that is likely to be kind of the basis of a lot of the pension pot. Uh, and if you um, uh, look at the returns on those, actually they shot up yesterday from 1.7% to 2%. Um, that, begin, believe me, is the beginnings of something, I think. Um, uh, because at the same time we saw the equities uh, switch into equities and they, the, the, the um, FTSE moved to 6,100 from 6. Mm. Um, what we're beginning to see is big institutions starting to see this. They're starting to worry and they're starting to move out of bonds, government bonds in particular, and into equities and into property. I do a lot of property in Gatehouse because it's Sharia compliant. And believe me, we're watching property uh, returns drop like a stone uh, as property prices rise. Um, and I haven't seen this speed of rise for some time. So, um, so my disaster is that uh, uh, increasingly people like me, uh, who are pensioners, uh, you need to get your, you need to be very cautious. You're likely to find that your pension pot is going to be destroyed. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, because of, you know, if government bonds go back to mean revert to let's say 5%, 
the value of your 15-year bonds is going to less than half. Yeah? So that's kind of how much your pension pot is going to reduce by about, let's say, 50%. If it only goes to 5%, if it goes to anything like it did in the 70s, uh, you, it'll go, you know, we'll be beat at 154 billion versus 15 pfennigs. You know, um, it, it'll be worth nothing. That's the looming social disaster, um, because I think that's a social disaster, not just a, an economic disaster. And I did want to make this correlation very strongly. What would you do? Um, personally, uh, I can only, uh, you know, I can't advise you, I'm not a financial advisor, I'm not registered with one. I can tell you what I do, uh, which is uh, uh, basically I'd borrow a lot of money and I'd buy real assets and gold. Um, and I'd tell the government, go stuff their bonds. The Bank of England can hold a lot of them. Um, they're going to be worth nothing. Mike. Uh, anything? Any, anything? Yeah, no, I was just, what, just thinking that, that probably you ought to take as much cash out of your pension as possible if you wanted to. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that um, there's probably a misconception behind the, the question on accounting and uh, tax because it isn't governments that typically set the accounting regulations for. Uh, listed companies, it's the I International Accounting Standards Board, which is not a government organisation at all, it's a private organisation. For the UK non-listed companies, it was the uh, UK standard, Standards uh, Board. But what you've then also got is a separate set of um, tax laws. And that's where uh, people like... Um, sort of uh, Google uh, have, have been you know, using uh, the transfer pricing to get as little uh, profits made in the UK as possible. So to get their profits taxed in other countries which have uh, lower corporation tax than the UK. But basically, um, I don't really see, um, you know, on, the, on, on the accounting rules, then government isn't involved in the accounting rules. Now, what, whether the government may be setting the tax rules to maximise profit, I think, is another um, issue. Um, and there is probably some evidence of that uh, recently, but certainly not. But on the accounting side, I, I would say no. Um, uh, no one took up the question of productivity. Um, I, I think the... Um, I think that the point you made is correct. In, in particularly an economy like ours that is so rich in, or poor in financial services, whichever you want to look at it, if financial services account for a great deal of our, our activity and the value added reported in the national accounts and GDP uh, is blended with the bubble profits um, on asset prices, uh, then, of course, GDP will be overstated, and as the bubble deflates, you will um, get a reported decline in productivity. So you have an overstatement of productivity in the boom period, as you've had an overstatement of wealth. And the, our problem is that we're continuing to overstate wealth um, in the face of reality. Um, the, the number of papers that suggest that you don't get back to the trend line productivity or GDP growth anytime soon after a, a bust. And the danger, this rather lends itself to Brandon's argument, is um, that if the central banks uh, set monetary policy to go back to our old trend line GDP growth, uh, they will actually um, create a very inflationary circumstance. Um, that's my thought. I think at that point, I'm afraid we're going to have to um, draw this evening, this afternoon's um, the event to a, a gentle close. First of all, I would like to um, thank our speakers very much indeed, Edward Chancellor, Brandon Davis, and Professor Mike Jones. Some um, wonderful collection of expertise here from different angles, a lot of individual opinions, which uh, is always very good for a symposium. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your particular. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So um, perhaps a few um, concluding remarks from uh, myself. It seems to me really, ultimately, that there are two methods of control. There's the external one of regulation, backed up by sanction, which appears to be very difficult to get right. Um, if the regulation is too fierce, then it simply drives people away. And if it's too lax, then someone will find a way to get round it 
and then the danger is that it will simply be ignored. The other method is essentially internal. Um, interesting that even some of the big fraudsters don't appear to have started out as such, to have drifted into it, perhaps been slightly coerced into it, been too proud to admit that they've got it wrong, afraid of um, sanctions or public disgrace. Um, do people break the law regularly and in large numbers, knowing the long-term damage to what could be their product, their company, or their market? Now, um, my word is my bond, I'm afraid, is no more than a pleasant memory, and I'm not quite sure to what extent it really was. And if there's one man shaking his head. <laughs> All right, your word wasn't your bond, Brandon, but I'm sure that probably yeah. um, But... Um, social sanction, ostracism, not being one of the club, being drummed out of the regiment, um, was that enough to keep people on the straight and narrow? Well, of course, it wasn't going to stop the avowedly criminal or the really opportunist, opportunistic from pursuing their own ends. And the other interesting thing we've heard about is this collective mania, um, whether it's railway shares, a dot-com bubble, uh, the black tulip to my surprise, hasn't been mentioned this afternoon because that's a, an absolutely glorious one. And I'd like to boil this down to a market trader of my acquaintance. Now, when I say market, I don't mean the square mile. He was a market trader in South London called Louis. And he was a permanent fixture in the market with his flat hat and his trench coat he'd probably worn in the army. He was liked, he was respected, and a little bit feared because there was an edge to Louis. And when someone came up with an offer or a deal which looked a little bit, you know, off-centre, there'd be a twinkle in his eye and he'd say, yeah, I should Oko Boko. And for any Americans who may be in the audience, Oko Boko, of course, is a derivative from the Cockney, I should Coco, meaning I should think so, but more specifically, the exact opposite. What he meant was, I wasn't born yesterday, what kind of fool do you take me for, and I'm not that daft. And Louis, I'm very pleased to say, prospered. Indeed, he retired to Canvey Island. So, in his memory, in his memory, and he was a character, I would like to present this afternoon the Oko Boko principles of banking, which will keep the Square Mile, Wall Street, Frankfurt, and even the Russians in place. If it looks too good to be true, then it probably is. High rewards equal high risk, and high risks may lead to breaking the law. And if some people get rich, others get poor even quicker. So perhaps we can sum it up by saying it's the quick buck that needs to stop here, and it needs to stop now. And if you're taking enough for yourself, or let's be honest, just a little bit more than you might need, always leave something for the next person, because that way the market remains intact. Um, whatever the activity, it shouldn't leave terminal damage in its way. Now, perhaps none of this would have stopped my favourite, the black tulip, the South Sea bubble, or even Gulliver and his projectors. However much we regulate, we've heard of so many cases, nobody's mentioned Rolls Razor, Emil Savundra, and of course the Ponzi schemes, the salami swindles, so simple they could go on forever if people didn't get greedy. But really, at home, it's essential that people have got to ensure that somehow, and this is the subject of another symposium, how does the City of London restore its reputation? How could it maintain it? Because if London does not remain as a major world trading centre, we will all be the poorer for it. Thank you very much indeed.